Thank you all for coming. And I might as well, I'm gonna like to share my little uh, Lou Rockwell story with you first. And my first contact with Lou Rockwell was I was an assistant professor of economics at George Mason University, and I got a postcard in the mail announcing the creation of the Mises Institute. I was very excited about that because I had studied the Austrian school. I used human action as a textbook my first semester in graduate school. And, uh, and so I sent them a small donation. And they sent me a, a Mises tie, a necktie, with, a, with Ludwig von Mises on it. And I wrote Lou and Murray Rothbard, who, uh, who was the first academic vice president, a, a thank you letter saying that I will wear the necktie uh, with pride in the halls of academe. And I told them it would have the same effect as flashing a Christian cross in front of Dracula. <laughs> and, and, uh, and that was my first uh, contact with Lou. And then when they started publishing The Free Market, a monthly publication, I started sending them articles. And then uh, they invited me to speak at the conferences. And so I've been associated with them from the, from the very beginning, 42 years, it's hard to believe, and uh, <clears throat> all of that. And now my, my topic today is uh, how court historians turn political villains into heroes. And I'm gonna start with a quote from Murray Rothbard in his, his uh, essay, Anatomy of the State. Uh, where he said that in return for power, positions, and money, intellectuals persuade the majority that their government is good, wise, and at least inevitable. This is the vital stock of the intellectuals. The molding of opinion is what the state most desperately needs to retain power. And so I'm gonna talk about three people that the, the, who Murray called the court historians have uh, written about that, that creates this image of them as uh, saints, or in the case of Lincoln, a, a god, uh, as far as that, a deity, as far as that goes. Alexander Hamilton, Henry Clay, and Lincoln, uh, that fit into this. Uh, my friend Brian McClanahan wrote a book on uh, Hamilton, and it's called How ha Alexander Hamilton Screwed Up America. <laughs> and and he, he, he points out that the new hero of the left is Hamilton because they, they discovered that he's the real founding father of big government in America. That's why they produced this awful uh, play on Broadway about Hamilton, and, and, uh, and they, they, they trashed Jefferson, and they love Hamilton. David Brooks write, wrote in the uh, Wall Street Journal that Hamilton single-handedly, quote, created capitalism all by himself, <laughs> all by himself. When I, when I read this, I have, in my home, I have, I have that famous picture of God creating man. You know, where there's a finger, there's God's hand, and there's a human hand, God creating man. And David Brooks must think that it's not God's hand, it's Alexander Hamilton's hand. It's, 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 it's creating, you know, the spark uh, for, to, to capitalism. Michael Lind wrote a book called Hamilton's Republic, and he was just giddy over the fact that he wrote Lincoln, both Roosevelt's and Lyndon Johnson were all Hamiltonians. You know, yay, Hamilton. When, when the, uh, the Brookings Institution, the left-wing Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C., when they, they uh, were preparing for the election of Hillary Clinton, and they, they, so they produced uh, dozens of articles and several books uh, on a, sort of a menu for massive government intervention, and naturally, what do you think they called it? The Hamilton Project. And so, so, uh, so uh, uh, McClanahan is right. They, they, they discovered the real founding father of big government. And it's interesting if you, when you read the, these biographies, uh, the official biographies of these people, things that we think would, uh, would be awful, they think are wonderful. And so if you read, and so they, they make these people out to be saintly because of these awful ideas. But to them, you know, it's sort of unlimited government. And that's a good thing. So, so what did Hamilton do? Why, why does the left love Hamilton all of a sudden so much? Well, he invented the implied powers theory of the Constitution in his debate with Jefferson over a central bank. He said, yes, there's no, uh, no justification for a central bank in the Constitution, but if you read between the lines of the Constitution, uh, there are implied powers, and, and a bank would be one of the implied powers. Jefferson responded, in essence, by saying, I've read between the lines and there's just blank space there. But, uh, but, uh, but, but this whole idea of the living constitution, applied power, that was, came from Hamilton. He praised the sovereignty of the states. He was a, he was a sort of a, a, 
early Confederate states' rights Federalist uh, in, his, in the Federalist Papers, and then he spent the rest of his life trying to destroy states' rights. Uh, he, he invented the whole theory that the Constitution was not ratified by the people of the states. It was ratified by the whole people. He said that we just, just made that up uh, out, of, out of thin air. It's not true at all in, in any way. Uh, he talked George Washington into conscripting 15,000 men to put down the Whiskey Rebellion, which occurred pretty much in the same neighborhood where Ron Paul went to college in the western Pennsylvania, near you know, Washington, Pennsylvania. Uh, the farmers of Pennsylvania had been turning grain into alcohol and, 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 they, and, and shipping it across the state to sell. They made more money that way, and they put a special tax on alcohol. So they, they, they had a, a tax protest. Hamilton wanted to hang all the leaders. He, they rounded them up. They made them walk clear across the state to, to Harrisburg in the snow. And, uh, and, but in the end, George Washington pardoned everybody. But the, the historians lie about this. You read the books about the Whiskey Rebellion, except for one that I know of. They'll say this proved that the government uh, proved that they have the power to institute any kind of tax that they want. Well, no, it didn't. Uh, you know, George Washington pardoned everybody. They didn't, they didn't execute the, anybody. They didn't, they didn't put these people in prison uh, for doing this. So the Whiskey Rebellion succeeded. Jefferson was elected, and he ended these taxes. You know, that's the real story. Hamilton championed 17th century mercantilism as his economic policy. And uh, comically, he called it the American system. Even though it was 17th and 18th century European uh, mercantilism, and so, so he, and the American system was protectionist tariffs, what we today call corporate welfare, and a national bank controlled by politicians. Uh, it, was, it was the British mercantilist system uh, run by Americans. <clears throat> so that's what Hamilton had to say on economics. At the Constitutional Convention, he proposed a permanent president who would appoint all the governors, and the governors would have veto power over all state legislation. So okay, essentially a king. And this is one of the reasons why Jefferson thought that he was a mortal enemy of freedom with ideas like this. And, it, and, and uh, you know, when I reread my notes this morning, I wrote in the, in the common, in the margin here, can you spell government by executive order? That seems to be, uh, you know, you know, the, a very Hamiltonian thing, and, and and why you know the leftists usually celebrate when the Biden or whoever is in that job just signs signs something, another dictate uh, to us. Uh, Hamilton uh, mastered the whole idea of you know think of his policy, his economic policies, protectionist tariffs, special interest legislation, corporate welfare for selected businesses, special interest legislation a national bank run by politics, special interest legislation. He had dozens and dozens of phrases that he used for the common good, the, the public good. I wrote down just some of them. These are Hamilton's words to describe these policies, these special interest policies. Um, so let's see, uh, public good, public interest, public will, public safety, public welfare, public felicity, public happiness, general good, general interest, common interest, national interest, national happiness. These are from his speeches. True interests of the community, good of the whole community, and my favorite, common interest of humanity. So higher prices through protectionism are supposed to be the common interest through humanity, according to, uh, to Alexander Hamilton. He was the first to pervert the, the Commerce Clause of the Constitution so that it now has expanded to give government almost uh, unlimited power to regulate almost anything. Originally, the Commerce Clause gave the federal government the right to, uh, the ability to regulate uh, free trade between the states. Free trade between the states was the policy. One state can't ta put a tax, an import tax, on something from another state. And Hamilton made the argument that, well, certainly, uh, a product that crosses states' lines, if the government has the right to regulate that, well then, it also should have the right to regulate what goes on in the, produ in the production of that product in the first state, you know, where it came from. 
Okay, it's just, just, you know, just a matter of logic, he said. And so he was the first to concoct a lawyerly argument that would uh, use the Commerce Clause as a way of destroying the true meaning of the Constitution, uh, and in addition to the implied powers. He also made the argument that if the government does something that's unconstitutional, the act of doing it makes it constitutional. How about that? <laughs> How about that? So, so if we declare, if we wage war without the consent of Congress, the fact that we did it makes that war constitutional, according to Alexander Hamilton. Now, this this had to have been like a trial balloon in his time to see, you know, how far can we go? But we certainly we've gone that far. Okay, he praised the central bank. Of course, he was, you know, he was he was the uh, a speech by Ben Bernanke that I read a couple years ago. Uh, come out and said. Alexander Hamilton was the founder, founding father of central banking in America. And of course, coming from Bernanke, he thought it was, that was a great thing. You know, I think it's, it's an odious thing. You know, he put that on his tombstone. And, uh, and, and one of my friends, uh, the late Butler Schaefer, once uh, stood above Hamilton's uh, gravestone. Uh, near the, it's near the 9-11. It's, it's in the churchyard across the street from the 9-11 site. Hamilton is buried there. And, uh, and, and he told me that he stood there for a good five minutes to make sure there was no motion, nothing was moving, other <laughs> Hamilton's uh, yeah, gra grave site. Hamilton's political disciples, Chief Justice John Marshall, Justice Joseph Story, and Hugo Black, another Supreme Court justice, who Brian McClanahan calls FDR's favorite Ku Klux Klansman, it's true, uh, they all cemented these myths into, into government policy through their decisions on the Supreme Court over the decades. Uh, the Marshall, some of his opinions were verbatim of, of Hamilton's speeches, uh, uh, literally, word for word. I've read through them, they're just identical. And so, and he was the Chief Justice for 36 years. So, so these are the reasons why, why the left uh, has adopted Hamilton as their new, uh, new baby. They, 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 they love Hamilton now. Uh, they'll probably produce another corny play. And Hamilton uh, is, is sort of the, the founding father of crony capitalism, corporate welfare. And uh, one of my blogs on lourockwell.com uh, several months ago, I discovered that uh, the guy who produced this bad play on Broadway got uh, $600,000 from the U.S. government in COVID relief money. <laughs> and so, so, so a play about the founding father of corporate welfare gets corporate welfare. Is, 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 how, how fitting is that? Uh, the next, next example of uh, turning a, a political villain into a hero is Henry Clay. When Donald Trump made his first speech as president on economics, he went to Lexington, Kentucky, uh, because that's where the uh, Henry Clay's uh, museum is. And Henry Clay picked up the Hamiltonian mantle of the American system. If you, if you were to go, go online on Amazon and buy a, a book, a biography of Henry Clay, you'll read all about the American system. But it was Hamilton who coined that phrase, American system. But the policies were the same, protectionism, corporate welfare, national bank. And Clay was, he picked up that political mantle after the Federalist Party of Hamilton disappeared. And if you were to go into uh, the museum in Lexington, <clears throat> uh, the Henry Clay Museum, you'd, you would find a book on display called Henry Clay, the Essential American by uh, David and Jean Heidler. And it's, it's become sort of the, at least in, in modern, in our day, today, the latest, the biography of Henry Clay, okay? And so, and they say there in the book, he's, quote, commonly regarded as the greatest U.S. senator in history. <clears throat> well, how many people have you in, in the room commonly regarded, or never even know anything about Henry Clay as far as, far as that goes? And, but he was the political son of the American system. And the writer, Edgar Lee Masters, in his book on Lincoln, Lincoln the Man, <clears throat> explains that Abraham Lincoln, in turn, was the political son of Henry Clay. Henry, uh, Lincoln once said uh, that he got all of his ideas on policy from Henry Clay. He called him the beau ideal of a statesman when he did a eulogy for Henry Clay. 
So, so, and so here, here's what Edgar Lee Masters said about clay which I, uh, and his system, which I think is dead on. It's exactly, exactly right. He says, uh, here's Edgar Lee Masters, uh, Clarence Darrow's law partner, by the way, Edgar Lee Masters. Uh, clay was the champion of that political system which doles out favors to the strong in order to win and keep adherence to the government. His system offered shelter to devious schemes and corrupt enterprises. He was the beloved son of Alexander Hamilton with his corrupt funding schemes, his superstitions concerning the advantages of public debt and a people tax to make profits for enterprises that cannot stand alone. His example and his doctrine led to the creation of a party, the Whig Party, that had no platform to announce because its principles were plunder and nothing else. <laughs> it's, it's probably a good idea if, you're, if your principle is plunder to keep it quiet. Don't, don't let the public know that's what you're up to. Call it the common good, the public good, the, the general good of humanity, all that stuff. Okay, and that's, and, and, and uh, Hamilton paved the way for that too. Uh, and this of course is what attracted a young Abraham Lincoln to the Whig party. He, as, as a young man, he said he, his goal was to be the DeWitt Clinton of Illinois. DeWitt Clinton was a governor of New York who was uh, notorious for being probably the sleaziest corrupt politician of his era, uh, a real pork barrel uh, politician, machine politician, and that's what Lincoln aspired to be as a young man, but in Illinois. <clears throat> These writers, the Heidlers, in this biography, they say Henry Clay owned slaves and continued to buy them for his whole life. He says, but he was not relentless in pursuing runaway slaves. Now how they knew how relentless he was, they don't say, okay? Uh, but, but the truth is Henry Clay did go to court several times to retrieve his runaway slaves, and he proposed legislation in Congress to strengthen the Fugitive Slave Act. And so how can these people write that he was, oh, I wasn't very relentless in pursuing, you know, he did, he did more than any other slave owner in America could have done. He was, a, he was a, the, uh, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, and he wanted a, a law that would strengthen the Fugitive Slave Act. That's as relentless as you can get uh, as, far, as far as that goes. But then the, these biographers write that, no, I wasn't very, rel very relentless. They write also, quote, he was always ambivalent about owning people, and he hated slavery, but he always owned them. You know, he, he, uh, okay. And my favorite line in his book is that the reason he never freed any of the slaves is he liked farming too much. <laughs> like Henry's out there at daybreak walking behind a horse-drawn plow. He liked he likes to be a farmer so much. This is the type of thing. If you get into the the biographies by the court historians, making saints out of devils, these are the types of things you have to look for. Okay, and, and you've got to read them very carefully sometimes because they might go on for 50 pages of boring facts and then there's this that pops up, this sort of thing. He made an, quote, I'm quoting them again, he made an impassioned speech against continuing slave importations. Well, the economics of that is that Henry Clay owned hundreds of slaves. You reduce the supply, supply of slaves in America you increase the price of slaves. And so he was increasing the value of his property by, by, by wanting to uh, ban the importation of more slaves. So he was not as, not as saintly as they're implying when he said that. He declared slavery to be constitutional. It wasn't, con there was nothing in the Constitution. That, uh, that, that's why, by the way, Abraham Lincoln boasted in his first inaugural address that a constitutional amendment had just passed the House and the Senate, controlled by the Republican Party at the time, to prohibit the federal government from ever interfering with slavery. It was called the Corwin Amendment. And so here, decades earlier, here's Henry Clay saying it's, it's already constitutional. Well, Lincoln would never have had to say that if it already was constitutional, you know, in the Constitution, and it wasn't. And this reminded me of how, you know, the great Lysander Spooner wrote a whole book called The Un Unconstitutionality of Slavery. Uh, and, and he was right, and Henry Clay was wrong about that. Henry Clay is praised by, in this book and all other books about him, he's called the great compromiser. <clears throat> well, to people like, who believe like us, compromising your principles is not 
the best thing. Best thing. But he, they praise him. He's a great compromiser. He's great at compromising his principles. Uh, well, what, the, what did he compromise about? Well, the one example is the tariff of abominations, the 1828 tariff that increased the average tariff rate to about 50% on imports and almost caused South Carolina to secede at the time. And, and they, that, the South Carolinians call it the uh, tariff of abominations. And they, they, re, they renegotiated the, uh, the tariff down over 10 years. And Henry Clay was a part of that. So they call him great because he was a part of the, the committee that negotiated down the tariff after he sponsored it and created the problem in the first place. Same with the War of 1812. He was the biggest war hawk for the War of 1812. And then after the whole thing blew up in his face, uh, he was on the committee to negotiate the treaty with the British over the War of 1812. And again, he's a great compromiser, but he was as responsible as anybody for the, for the fact that there was a War of 1812. Okay, And <clears throat> they... they, they, um, they relentlessly badmouthed Clay's biggest critic uh, John Randolph, the great John Randolph. They call him, they, they, these authors call him all kind of names. They call him uncontrollable, a Cassandra, a peculiar character, on and on and on. And that's how, the, that's how these things work. But Randolph, Randolph and Henry Clay uh, had a duel. They fought a duel, and unfortunately, they both missed. <laughs> um, and, uh, but here's a quote, a quote from John Randolph about Henry Clay that reminded me of something H.L. Mencken would have said. He, said. he said, Henry Clay, he is a man of splendid abilities, but utterly corrupt. He shines and stinks like a rotten mackerel by moonlight. I, I kind of like that. Okay, I kind of like that. Now, a lot of you are familiar with my writings on Lincoln. And so the last example I have here is a Lincoln and maybe... I'll be repetitive to a lot of you because I know a lot of you have already bought my books and all that. But I'll go over some of the things why. You know, Lincoln, is, he's, he's the, uh, the big guy in terms of creating, uh, uh, vil uh, turning villains in, into heroes. So why do, they, why, do they, why do they love Lincoln so much? Uh, well, he destroyed the voluntary union of the founding fathers and placed it with a coerced union held together by bloodshed uh, by, by waging a war. He waged war on civilians for four years, killing at least 50,000 of them, according to James McPherson, the, the Princeton uh, Civil War historian. If you standardize for today's population, that would be like the U.S. government murdering uh, 500,000 Americans in, in, in four years. He supported that constitutional amendment to prohibit the government from ever interfering in slavery, in fact, he was the author of it. Doris Kearns Goodwin, in her biography of Lincoln, uh, cites all the, the primary sources showing it was Lincoln's idea. And he got William Seward to get this through the Senate. So it came from Abraham Lincoln, and then he lied about it in his first inaugural address by saying, I haven't seen the, con the, the text of this amendment, but I've heard about it, and, and I support it. Can you imagine that? A trial lawyer who gets elected president saying, oh, I have no idea what this amendment says, but I'm for it. I'm all for it. <clears throat> so it was a big lie. It was a big lie. He illegally suspended habeas corpus, mass arrested tens of thousands of northern state citizens for merely criticizing him. He, he, he took it on himself to redefine treason uh, to mean criticizing him and his administration. And of course, treason, is, as, uh, as Ryan said earlier, is <clears throat> levying war upon the states, meaning... Virginia, South Carolina, Mississippi, the states. Not something called the United States government in Washington, D.C., the states. And that's exactly what Lincoln did, and therefore he and everyone around him was guilty of treason for, for doing that. Well, they, they love Lincoln. <clears throat> um, I'm running out of time here. He was a lifelong advocate of colonization or the deportation of all the black people out of the country. Even uh, there's a new book, well, not new anymore, but Colonization After Emancipation uh, that, uh, by Philip Magnus uh, and, uh, that shows that to his dying day, he, he and his staff in the White House were work, counting the number of ships it would take to deport all the black people even after slavery was, uh, was legally, would be uh, legally ended shut down over 300 opposition newspapers in the, more, in the North and imprisoned uh, many of the editors and owners. 
He rigged the 1864 election in a number of ways. Uh, so censorship and rigged elections uh, was part of the Lincoln administration. Sound familiar uh, to you? Use slaves as pawns in a war that really, uh, he proclaimed, had nothing to do with them. His, uh, his, uh, he claimed it himself, the, the official war aims resolution of the United States Congress, the Crittenden Johnson resolution, clearly stated that the war is about save, keeping the union together and it, said, and it said very clearly it has nothing to do with uh, what they call the domestic institutions of the states by which they meant slavery. So they announced to the world that. Lincoln also announced to the world that he said it was his duty to collect the tariffs and imposts, meaning the protectionist tariffs, which had been more than doubled two days earlier. And then he said, but beyond that, there'll be no invasion of any state. You know, why would a president talk, even use the word invasion of a state? Uh, unless he intended it over tax collection. And so that's what he announced in his first inaugural address. If there's going to be a war, it'll be over forcing the southern states to, to continue sending tax revenue to Washington, D.C. Those are Lincoln's words. Uh, I bet you weren't taught that in, in school, especially if you went to public school, uh, were you? He invoked the first military conscription law, and then he ordered the execution of, dis of uh, deserters, he strongly enforced the Fugitive Slave Act during his administration. He ignored the fact that all the rest of the world, including all the northern states, New York, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, ended slavery peacefully. There was no war anywhere. The British, the French, the Danes, the Dutch, they all had slaves. They all found a way to end it uh, peacefully. The Emancipation Proclamation specifically uh, d you know, omitted all of the areas of the country that were in control of the Union Army at the time from the Emancipation Proclamation, including the entire state of West Virginia, which uh, uh, the, the, the Lincoln administration uh, illegally orchestrated the secession of. And West Virginia was the last slave state to enter the Union, and it was entered the Union at, by the, work, the works of the Republican Party during the Lincoln administration. They ran the government from Alexandria, Virginia, and it gave the Republican Party two more senators and, and another congressman. And he raised tariffs 10 times during his, uh, and he instituted the first income tax in American history, passed the legal tender acts and the national currency acts to monopolize the money supply, and they got the ball rolling finally on massive federally funded corporate welfare with the subsidies to the railroad corporations. Before the war, Lincoln was a wealthy railroad corporation lawyer. Uh, he, he traveled uh, throughout the Midwest in a private train car, courtesy of the Illinois Central with an entourage of junior executives. He was offered the job of the general counsel of the New York Central Railroad. Uh, that's who he was. If you visit Springfield, Illinois tomorrow and visit his house, it's on a place called Old, Old Aristocracy Row, and it was the biggest house on Old Aristocracy Row. Yes, he grew up in a log cabin, but everybody on the American frontier grew up in a log cabin. And so that was <laughs> nothing, nothing special. People still grow up in log cabins all the time. Some of them are very nice and very expensive. And so, <clears throat> so that's my time is about run, run out. And, and so, uh, so that's my story, and I'm sticking to it uh, for now, about how they, they turned saints into heroes uh, in, the, in the history profession.